everybody we are back with the seventh out of ten of the goose podcast mini series today i'm catching up with robert fitzhugh the festival director for the dublin smartphone phone film festival and i stumbled over it again like this is going to be a regular occurrence for me anyway hi rob nice to see you again it's been a while uh do you want to tell us about yourself and what the dublin smartphone film festival is and i got it right that time you did and you, you didn't say fist festival so i'm not going to prison <laughs> um so yes uh, thanks so much for having me on to chat a little bit about the dublin smartphone film festival we're old hat at this point uh, there was a period of time where we were cool and trendy and we were doing hipster things but it's almost become a moot point uh, but we'll get onto that in a bit uh, effectively we are the dublin smartphone film festival and we are a film festival shot for Film shot on we're a film festival now. I'm now I've got whatever you've got. Uh, we are a film festival for film shot on mobile phones, uh, and effectively, it's about kind of the whole ethos is about kind of making filmmaking accessible to everybody, and that expensive equipment shouldn't be a barrier to entry. Um, and that's effectively the logic behind it. Awesome. You're in your seventh year now, if I'm correct, and it's next month, March, mid March, isn't it? When the this year's event is happening, uh, mid March, Mar no, March 30th. So March okay. 30th, end of March. Um, so yeah, we're in our seventh year, believe it or not. Um, it's been, can't believe it's been that long. Uh, I suppose the whole COVID thing kind of really made it feel like it, 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 it a weird kind of wilderness years there for a couple of years. But yeah, we started out in humble beginnings in um, the Generator Hostel. And we've gone all the way to the Irish Film Institute, uh, where we have some stuff on this year there as well. Uh, and effectively, yeah, it's the little festival that could um we it's really i mean we're not the oscars nor do we ever pretend to be the oscars nor do we want to be the oscars and yeah. um, it's less of a it's less of a festival to kind of reward filmmakers and more of a community designed to encourage filmmaking is probably the best way to, to, to look at it and the festival is kind of a a culmination of of different people creating throughout the year um, and that's kind of how we see it and then we reward those filmmakers but really the reward is 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 kind of having your voice heard and you know being yeah. taken seriously um as a legitimate artist that's really cool so i suppose a good a good place to start would be like where did you get started how did you get started and kind of what what brought this whole you know festival to life oh easy i was an incredibly untalented filmmaker um and so uh, that's kind of the short hour. no I, I i'm not a tech person i never was a tech person um and so i went back i have a background in festival management uh, and film studies film theory uh, yeah. and i thought at one point in my life i should really learn to make a movie uh, a practical side of it um, and so i went to study film um and i just found um I didn't, I don't like, I, Jesus Christ, I have cameras, I have drones, I use them all, but I, I'm not one of these camera nerds. I'm not one of these people who's like specifically enamored with, with the technology side of filmmaking. Sure. Uh, I like the storytelling elements of it. I like when you've got a sound guy who knows how to do sound. I like when you have a cameraman who knows how to do camera. Um, and, but I suppose I found um, when I was studying film, I found that there was a, uh, probably the easiest way to describe it is they, they say you can't polish a third, but I found that, you know, there was a, there's this conception that the better your equipment was, the better your film was. So the more you spent on your camera, the better your film was. And there was no real conversations being had about, you know, what's your story and, and performances and, you know, are we putting energy into blocking? Are we putting energy into lighting? It was just like, wow, your camera costs 25 grand. So by default, your film is going to be better than mine. And I suppose I found this ethos to be troubling. Um, and also I found film to be, when I was studying film, it was very much like uh, we the filmmaking process peaked in 2002 and um, it, it hasn't changed, nor does it, is it ever going to change since then. And so you they kind of ignored the Internet and it kind of ignored the ability to be able to self-distribute. At the time, you could distribute your own films on Amazon Prime. I don't know if anyone remembers that you could do that up until not too long ago. You get your own films on Amazon Prime. Oh. Um but uh, so there was a there was a whole avenue of the filmmaking side that uh, in terms of marketing and distribution and access to equipment and self distribution that was being ignored. Um, and so I set up the festival just as sort of a lark. I shot a phone. I, I was producing a friend's film and I shot a film, a, a stop motion animation using my phone. And uh, it was a horror movie and it was crap. I mean, it was just pure nonsense. I was making it up my house. Uh, today it'd be your average TikTok video and um, I put it together and I submitted it to a bunch of festivals and then I realized that there was a community of filmmakers out there who weren't possibly not that either they weren't being taken seriously or they didn't think anyone would take them seriously so I put together the event just as a way to kind of bring filmmakers together and give them a chance to show off their their wares that's really cool I guess, I guess it, yeah it makes sense like 
I'd even know a few like camera nerds and it is very kind of that closed off space of, you know, it's about the equipment and less about the story. I've looked at some of the videos that are on the site. It's very much 15 minutes is the kind of max I, max time, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, we're we're big believers that short films should be short. And to be honest with you, 15 minutes is 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 even too long. I think the optimum length should be six or seven minutes, uh, depending on what your story is and depending on how good it is. There's a whole programming thing goes into that in terms of the length of time you can allocate two films and fitting in as many films as you can. So 15 minutes is, is generally the furthest we go, but we always encourage filmmakers to make your films as short as possible. Sure. Um, and yeah, we do. We did up until this year, we're not doing features for logistic purposes. It's just very hard to, to find screenings for them. Uh, but in the last couple of years, we have done feature films. Um, uh, and that's been kind of an interesting experiment. Um, and, it's, yeah. and, and it's been great. Yeah, is there... like? I guess like I'd like to know kind of like is there a major difference in the process between we'll say like traditional filmmaking versus you know the the phone approach uh no logistics what in terms of actually the process of putting something together no i mean the, the when i when i run filmmaking classes i effectively teach filmmaking classes i just you know you're using an accessible device that people in the class understand and because they understand their phone you're able to explain kind of weightier concepts to them where if you thrust a camera in front of somebody they'd be a bit like well what's this and how do i do this but no effectively there is some limitations there is some things you have to take into account in terms of mm -hmm. uh, lighting in terms of 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 kind of memory in terms of display and playback and and there's some technical things that you need to keep in mind when putting it together and and in terms of a lot of different things that you can do but for the most part no there's no real difference it's the same way i would say there's not much of a difference between you using an incredibly old film camera and you using a digital camera only that you'd be able to shoot more with a digital camera and sure, probably sure, sure. get a very different looking image depending on how you light it and so on and so forth yeah that's yeah that makes sense i mean like you actually kind of touched on it there. Like this is more than just a film festival. You do workshops, you do school projects. Um, I'd like to kind of maybe talk about the school projects first, uh, and what that looks like, how you know that whole project came about, what you do, because I definitely can see it in that. I guess we'll call them the TikTok generation, where it's it's all video content, and you know everybody wants to be a content creator. So like, how does this schools project you know work? I guess is the easiest way yeah, to so the schools the, the schools thing is funny. The schools thing came about um uh a long time ago where where because you know you, you probably know yourself did you do transition year? Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't do transition year and the funny thing about school and the funny thing about film as a as a as a, a potential career path for students is is that really unless you did transition year you weren't really exposed to film at all until you did your leaving cert and then after your leaving cert it was like you know what i like watching movies so i think i'm going to learn how to get them made uh, if you were lucky enough to have friends and a camera you might have been doing it in your own free time uh, but you were never really exposed to it as a as a discipline um at all and so I didn't do transition year, so I wasn't lucky enough to to do film in transition year, and and it is being folded into the curriculum now. And and I work an awful lot with teachers, um, and video is being brought into every aspect of school because it's an it, it's an easy way to engage with students. You know, why would you like which is more fun to do your Irish oral or to write a script in Irish and act it out and, and film it and cut it together? I mean, there's a there's a, a an interactive element to it that 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 makes it a lot more interesting and engaging for pupils. So the school thing came about really is just a way because they had access to iPads, they had access to phones, it was a way for younger students to get exposed to film at all different ages. Um, and so that's kind of how we did that. It's funny you mentioned TikTok. For a long time, I would run TikTok classes where I would like TikTok filmmaking classes. And I say TikTok filmmaking classes, but effectively we're, they're called that as a Trojan horse just to teach filmmaking classes. But really it's about teaching students how to tell a story in you know 30 to 60 seconds you know and it doesn't matter i, I was I, i'm a big fan of vine i'm a big fan of vine compilations from back in the day vine is one of those things that was one of the most incredible apps that was ever made and it was about 10 years ahead of its time yeah. um and but but i mean there was a, such imaginative filmmakers there who were able to tell stories in seven seconds succinct quick stories in seven seconds yeah. that had to start middle and end and they were funny and they were engaging and um, and so that's kind of the logic behind it is to, to to teach students how to make tell an engaging story or tell a story in a small amount of time using a tool that they're very familiar with which would be yeah. tiktok um, and that's kind of how that has gone and so still i i, I worked with schools the whole time 
and um, work with, I actually worked a lot with colleges. We worked a lot with colleges during COVID, um, interesting enough, right. because a lot of the students there would have paid to go to film school. And part of that is they get access to equipment and they get access to filmmaking equipment to do their projects. But obviously they couldn't get into college because of quarantines and lockdowns and things like that. Yeah. So I would have to teach them how to do it remotely and to do their college project, utilizing the tools they had at their disposal, which for most part, a lot of them was just a phone or a tripod. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's kind of a broad range of, of things. And it's funny because it stretches beyond that now. Video is filtered into every aspect of, of everything we do. Uh, and that's why I work with teachers. And that's why I work with all different disciplines and um, teaching them storytelling using video because, you know, they're going to use it in yeah. some aspect of their day to day. Makes sense. I miss Vine. I'm not going to lie. I miss Vine. Vine is excellent. And 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 I, I know a lot of the apps now. I mean, remember, I, they've gotten rid of it, I think. Or do they remember Instagram had a 15 second timer reels? I don't even know if they still have yeah, that. They still, have, they still have reels, but I think it's it's like a TikTok collapse. I find Instagram is very much like the, the stolen goods Section. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's it's the it's the it's the upmarket bootleg. You made something. Let's you know put a different cover on it and give you the same yeah. thing back to you. But I know that when you, I, I can't remember because I I I don't. I I generally have a rule where I only record reels that are about fifteen to twenty seconds long anyway. Yeah. But I know when you used to open reels, you used to get a choice between fifteen, thirty, 30 and, and sixty. But um. The but I mean, God, give give me seven seconds. There was a limitation that you only got seven seconds. You didn't get a choice to do more. You got seven yeah. seconds, yeah. and it's funny because that 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 app in its short space of time trained a whole lot of people on, on how to edit and how to yeah. think about editing and how to be impactful. And that was people were doing stuff on Vine that you know people are doing now on on TikTok, and they're like, yeah. oh, they're so great on TikTok. It's like people were doing this 10 years ago using a, a much more inferior and much more limited app. But, you know, with limitation comes creativity. And I suppose that's the idea behind the, the the shooting on your phones is that, you know, there's a limitation to what you can do maybe against traditional cameras. But, you know, I'm a big believer that that's where all the fun stuff happens when you chose yeah. you don't have money to this or your camera can't do this. So you can't do that. Or how am I going to do that? Then I'll figure it out. Uh, yeah, that no, makes sense. Like, what I always found, like the thing I found fascinating about TikTok is it was knocking around for years. Uh, it just never really penetrated the market over here until COVID. And then what you're really seeing, especially over the last few years, is a lot of even businesses and stuff transition over there because it's how to tell that story. It's not that kind of polished marketing, you know, the yeah, people, high, it's it's quick and dirty and that's what makes it authentic and yeah, people turn their people turn their nose up at that sort of like uh, to a degree. That sort of unless it's funny, that sort of incredibly polished, you know, like lifestyle type thing. People kind of turn their nose about because it's easier to get someone's attention. People, I suppose, you, you're being sold to twenty four seven now. So, um, TikTok can offer you offer businesses ways to sell that are, are, are less with less sheen, which makes you possibly feel like you're not being sold to. Um, and so that that sort of TikTokification of everything is going on, um, which I'm not, which I'm not against. It's great because if you're a content creator out there, you're someone that struggles with video. The barrier to create is so low because the expectation from your audience is not something polished. Mm -hmm. Where I have a I have a filmmaking discipline, so I'm almost incapable of of not overthinking things. So even my most casual videos are overthought and overfilmed. Um, to the nth degree because that's just the way my brain works but to anyone out there i'm envious of someone who can just pick up my, like an accountant who can just pick up their phone and fire out informative videos to 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 people you know with yeah. virtually no production value yeah like our tiktok martin is all over that it's do you know what? i really like the kind like I'm, obviously i'm biased naturally but the content that martin's been putting out on tiktok over the last year is brilliant it's it's short it's to the point and it's like teaching people about you know essentially making technology accessible through tiktok which is it's really good um but like back to this schools project uh like again there's a couple of videos on the site so anybody who wants to actually find out more about the dublin smartphone film festival the different bits and pieces that they do in terms of the film project the school project workshops and just even like looking at past entries the website is dublin smartphone film festival.com um and just even on like the the work the the other workshops that you do uh what are they <laughs> yeah uh, i do a, f a filmmaking workshops effectively uh, it could be editing it could be filmmaking um but effectively i do them uh with all ages and it's really just again it's it's it we've 
got them down to a fine art now, but it's really just, it's really a way to explain the concepts and the fundamentals of filmmaking, which don't change regardless of what device you use. It's really a way to explain that to people and to get them to understand it uh, without expensive technology or the perception of expensive technology being a barrier to that. Ooh. So that you can go in and you can explain to them blocking and you explain to them real thirds, explain to them lighting, all this sort of stuff. And you can do it with a device and they can go home and they can practice it straight away. And it's a lot like this idea that, you know, uh, when you learn to drive a car and you don't have a car to practice on and um, yeah. you, you, you might, it might be harder for you to kind of grapple with it, but they have a camera in their pocket and they go home and they can practice these things that they've picked up in class and they're not concerned that they need to run out and buy a, uh, uh, maybe a basic DLSR, but 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 that might be expensive in and of itself. So it's not an expense they have to incur. There's no blocking point for them to kind of pick up these things. And listen, I'm not an absolutist. I'm not one of these people who thinks that you should only make stuff on phones and you should only do this. Do whatever you're happy with. But it, as a as a way to to I I I, I use both uh, for very different things for very different mm-hmm. reasons. Uh, one has a different time commitment than the other, but I get a different uh, result from using it. Um, sure. And so I pick and choose my moments to use it. Uh, but I do like using my phone for for video simply because it's so fast and quick and I can create stuff quickly, it's particularly in the classes. I'm able to, we're able to shoot scenes for films, cut them together in real time and show them back uh, all in a single device um, and they can all do it simultaneously they're not reliant on you know everyone gathering around a, a camera and then transferring that footage from an, an sd card onto a computer and then logging into and all that sort of stuff so you remove all those steps and they get to shoot the film and then they get to sit down and they get to edit it there and then and so it this it minimizes that distance between um the creative and the 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 functional part of it and sure. they get to experience that in real time and so it sticks with them and and it, it, it makes the concepts easier for them to understand that makes sense. Uh, like, it's definitely one of those things that the technology in phones over the last, you know, five to eight years, I guess, like Sony, Samsung, they all have inbuilt editing tools. Apple are the same. Do I ask the loaded question of iOS versus Android? Where do we let, where do we sit? Or is there a preference? Or is it very much case if it doesn't matter? No that? preference. If you came to me in a class and you said, Rob, I'm thinking of getting an expensive phone, what would I get? The first thing I, I the first question I'd ask you is, well, what are you going to edit on? Yeah. And if they turned to me and they said, well, I'm going to edit using Premiere Pro, I'd say, well, then just get uh, a Galaxy or get an Android or some of like that. If you told me you were a Mac user, I'd say get a, an iPhone. I mean, I was an Android user for years and I bought an iPhone and within three days I had a Mac and an iPad because I was frustrated by the fact that I, f- I felt I was being punished by not yeah. being able to, because I was so used to connecting my Android to my PC and just lashing clips over there and I felt like I was just being punished uh, uh, um, and thing. But again, it's preference. What I would say is generally, like generally, as you know yourself, um, uh, Android is one operating system spread over thousands of handsets around the world. So uh, where iPhone is one operating system on one phone. So generally I find uh, apps and the interface and using those apps to run a little bit smoother on my iPhone than I would necessarily my Android. Case in point for a long time, any filmmakers out there would use an app called Filmic Pro. Uh, Filmic Pro is, I think, maybe died a death at this point um and black magic have an app out that's free that does most of the same functionality but filmic pro had a funny thing where i mean are you familiar with filmic pro very vaguely very like I'm, vaguely. I'm using i'm using it right now uh because it's got a clean hdmi out so I'm, this is my phone here and i'm using it right now as a as a tool to, to to stream but effectively filmic pro was maybe the industry standard for camera apps uh, and every filmmaker worth the salt was using it steven soderberg used it for a lot of his production stuff like that oh. he used to have a flat rate of maybe you'd pay i think it was 35 quid for the year uh, everybody loved it a lot of cool functionality kept getting better and better and better you could remote control your phone video camera app on an ipad all this sort of stuff and then they changed ownership or somebody bought it they tried to put it behind a paywall and it just kind of fell apart and so um i gradually they just started to alienate their audience and so people are gradually moving on to black magic's app which is um free and does a lot of the same stuff but i suppose the the the, the point is is that like I would use uh, that that app, Filmic Pro. When I open my Android, depending on my device, I'd get a lot of like bug notifications saying, "Hey, we fixed it on the Xiaomi, and we've done this on this, and we've done this on this." And it had it had slightly different functionality. For some reason, one of the lenses would would only shoot in black and white, uh, which is just a bug of the phone I was using. Uh, And so there's a little bit smoother and a little bit easier on the iPhone if you're willing to buy into their entire ecosystem. 
Yeah. No, there's plenty. Like there is plenty of good Androids out, out yeah. there that wouldn't be ridiculous pricing. Like oh, I don't know. I'd go. Sorry to interrupt. I'd go back and get a. I'd go back and get the a, a, a Google Pixel, and a Harpy because the camera. I've can yeah. I've compared the two, and the camera is way better on the Pixel than yeah. the iPhone. No, I have my Google Pixel now. Not 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 too impressed with this year's model, but I'm still on last year's model, and it's absolutely fantastic. I think that was 420, 430 euro when it was yeah. fresh out. So like, you have the likes of your Oppos, you have, you know, Xiaomi's, you have when well, you had Huawei, but they're kind of gone to the wayside a little bit. But like, I remember like when myself, Martin, and the lads worked in the phone shop, and the whole big song and dance when. I think it was Sony. Sony came out with like the 15 megapixel camera, like the 12 megapixel camera, the 15, the 20, and the iPhone was still rocking the five megapixel camera. Like those numbers have gone off the charts now. If you look yeah. at like the latest, um, the latest Samsung Galaxies, like the camera array on the back is like next level. It's nuts, and the zoom, and like you're going to get some like the even like the auto stabilizing features and everything like that. So you're always going to and like I drink an awful lot of energy drinks, so I'm always shaky as hell. <laughs> so it's like having you know the modern phones uh even from like the 400 euro mark they all have those kind of stabilizing tools and bits of pieces so you should be able to get like really sharp you know footage probably wouldn't recommend like your entry level you know phones but again you can still do some but it is stuff. funny i i alluded at the start of this conversation i alluded that it was all i mentioned that it was a bit of a moot point uh, uh at this point and and it is to be honest with you the, the quality has gotten so good um, and the thing I always say to filmmakers in a class is that if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, your film is crap or what did you film it on? Straight away, you're not making a film for that person. Uh, that's another filmmaker. And you're making a film for an audience. And nine times out of 10, your audience isn't going to care what it's filmed on as long sure. as they enjoy it. And when I teach classes, the example I always use is um, 28 Days Later. Um, and I always showed at the start that as an example. And I, you know, where they, where they filmed in London and it was empty. And I explained the rationality behind why they used the cameras they used, and um, and in terms of this, the amount of time they had to film, and all that sort of stuff, and how the choice of cameras ties into the overall look and feel and theme of the movie. So it all makes sense. But at the time, people were like, "Well, it's the death of cinema because you know this director is making a movie using digital cameras and not using uh, film cameras," and um, and so. It's it's it, it it but nobody cared. Nobody went to see twenty. Like I watched twenty eight days later, and yeah. I, I recognize it doesn't look good. But I never once thought this movie's garbage. <laughs> it's crap. Do you know what I mean? And generally, if you don't like something or you're not engaged in the story or it's not pulling you in, then you start to nitpick in terms of well, it looks a bit crap and all that sort of stuff. And um, but that's, I mean, you as I said, you can polish a turd. You could spend fifty grand on a camera and you could have a bad story poor acting and your people are still going to nitpick they might say they might say it looks great but that's not enough to sustain someone's interest for two hours so oh, yeah. it doesn't really matter anymore like people are watching stuff the whole time that they don't even realize they're filmed on phones music videos the news most of the news coverage when they're out and about filmed on phones all that sort of stuff and people don't care and um, and so generally if somebody says to me what's a film on i was like oh, you're not my audience because other filmmakers aren't my audience because I don't sit in an I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I don't sit in the cinema and nitpick over what cameras are used because I don't salivate over that much, nor do I really care. I'm yeah. sure other people do. And I'm sure people have a, a, a have a proclivity for that. And that's fine. But sure. You know, a lot of people would be like, I don't want to use my phone because people won't think I'm a serious filmmaker. And at the end of the day, you're making a film for an audience and your audience isn't going to give a shit. Like, is it one of the most iconic movies like the Blair Witch Project? And that's just which like i remember the blair witch project when yeah. that came out like that was you know dirty camera work and that was the point yeah i the the the, the genius behind that is that they tried to pass it off as real um yeah. and and so everyone was like well that's real do you know what i mean and and and, and it is still a very creepy movie uh yeah. and for the most part it's two people in the woods wandering over an app uh wandering over uh giving out over a map yeah. um but when it's scary it, it still lands um, and again that's limited they, they were able to do they got someone to stand in a corner it was the most terrifying things ever put on film and that was we only got very limited uh capabilities so let's use that to our advantage yeah but like that's the thing i think i think that's something that kind of got maybe lost for a while it's it's about the story and not about the production uh not looking at marvel or anything like that in particular oh yeah well, well and now i say all this but i've been doing this for a long time and you still that that sort of like i, I watched this hilarious video the other day uh on instagram and it was 
somebody doing like a voiceover and they're like, you know, can you be a filmmaker using a mobile phone? And they're like, of course. And they list out all the equipment you need. And it ends up being your phone plus 25 grand's worth of attachments. And you're like, it's the same problem permeates everywhere where, sure. you know, eventually it becomes like, I'm, I, I'm trying to work with a community of people to get them to be creative because I'm always looking at it from an arts perspective, but you still have a whole community on the other side who are salivating over the latest iPhone release and what you can do with it and, 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 and that sort of stuff. And, and yeah. so that mentality still exists. Oh, what did you film it on? I only used, had an iPhone 12. Oh, well, you need to use an iPhone 15. I was like, well, no, you don't. Do you know what I mean? And some of the best movies you've seen shot on phones are like iPhone eights and stuff like that. So that mentality will always exist because I think if I'm honest, there's people who would be kind of like who 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 maybe wouldn't be comfortable storytellers think well if i have a really good camera or a really good piece of technology it's going to look great and people respond to what looks great and the sad thing about it is is that i don't think people respond to anything that looks great anymore particularly from a social media aspect it's it's so easy to create content uh, which means there's a glut of it and um, yeah. and so like i've worked an awful lot with businesses in the past where they're like well people are going to watch your video because it looks great and i was like people probably won't even know your video exists unless you talk about it and most people yeah. don't yeah, and so it's marketing it's marketing your film i mean i know lots of filmmakers out there who 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 are very good at the marketing side and 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 might make something that is not as good as another filmmaker but the other filmmaker who's very talented at using the technology and the story and all sorts of stuff isn't good at telling people about it and it's the person who's out there hitting their pots together saying look at my film look at my film look at my film look at my film yeah. they're the ones that get the notice they're the ones that get the traction because they're willing to talk about it and try and differentiate themselves from the noise well, you, I, I definitely see another industries too it's definitely you can definitely see it majorly in the music industry as well um people like releasing teasers of songs on tiktok you know generating that hype well in advance i think one of the biggest artists that this is me going off on a tangent but one of the biggest artists on spotify last year was a guy called connor price he's a canadian rapper but totally independent and he basically built his audience solely on tiktok using 15 second videos yeah and now he was in i suppose it's top 20 most streamed artists last year or something like that yeah, right. it's funny. Like I'm, I'm working on a project right now uh, about sound of comics, and it's the same sort of thing. It's about how the, the, there's a gap between comedians who traditional comedians who would have worked on stage, and then the, uh, a kind of a newer bunch of comedians who who effectively have their own sketch shows uh, on social media. And there's yeah. this kind of there's, there's this kind of idea now where like the 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 more established comedians are kind of being they're kind of being driven to make video by their managers and all that sort of stuff, which is like, you need to start creating video, but that's not their discipline because it's a different yeah. discipline. They're performers, they're stage performers. And you might have comedians, traditional comedians who are very funny on stage, but might struggle with the, they have tons of funny ideas, but they just might struggle with the the the, the video side of it because it's not, just not the way their brain works. Yeah. And then you have other comedians who are really good at the <laughs> video side of it, but might struggle in the, uh, in the performance side of it and yet they have their own sketch shows and their own following online so they can drive people to go to their live shows so it's it's yeah. it does a, it's, a, it's just a it's kind of a switch it's, it's and there's an exp there's an exp um, expectation that everyone should have this discipline and they don't yeah it's like matt rife and andrew schultz have really grown their platforms through social media no, like madly enough matt rife was knocking around back in the days of nick cannon's wild and out oh well oh, okay yeah. That's like he's actually been around since then. He's one of the guys that was on the stage doing that. But he's only became relevant in the last 18 months. Why is that? Because he's good at making, you know, solid video content. And that's just man with phone telling jokes. It's very, very basic. Uh like, like I, 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 I don't know. It's one of these things. It's like, you know, I have a DSLR camera here. I'd say mm -hmm. I've taken out of the package twice. I still have three of the lenses wrapped up <laughs> still in their packaging. Cause I do most of my, you know mad bad yeah. ideas on the phone as i'm walking around i do i like i have two, i have three of them i'm just looking around this room i'm like where the hell are they i do i have my sony camera in a bag over there somewhere and it's fine like i do have a heavy duty i have a very expensive camera i have very expensive drones about i do use them but yeah i also it's also uh, uh there's an, also an optics perspective for me in all this like if i'm going to go around telling people to shoot in their phones i should really shoot in my phone so like i'd be very hesitant to use my camera for stuff like that i know some places i won't name any names and they 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 would have the same ethos but they film a lot of their social media stuff using 
uh, cameras. And so they're, they're, and I don't get that. I, no. I'm just like, well, I know, I know there's a certain polish to it that you want, but I don't understand it because it, it's counterintuitive to what you're saying. So like, I, I was very hesitant to have, um, uh, uh, like videographers at the festival i did in the first year and it was great but i was very hesitant to bring in a videographer to shoot because they would shoot on cameras and i didn't want to have a day where we were celebrating kind of accessible filmmaking and have somebody there with a big camera shooting stuff i yeah. do get a photographer to go in to take photos but the reason being is that is that the photos like any like any reason the the, the photos i get from the event i use repeatedly for a year i use it for press releases so i need a certain look and a certain uh, um, type of image that I can be sure will work for press release and stuff like that. I mean, I know last year somebody had approached me saying they they do photography for free using their phone. And I was like, listen, I would love that. But it's the one instance where I'd bring in a photographer because there's, uh, there's a specific use to that. If I didn't need it for print or if I didn't need it for all that sort of stuff, I w it wouldn't bother me so much. Yeah, but I'd be very hesitant. Stuff, media stuff. Pop, pop, pop. Yeah. Like it depends again, it depends on what you do. If I if it was yeah, if it was just going up on social media or whatever, I don't care. But if I want to build a website later on and I want a specific looking type of image that's of a certain quality, I know I'm gonna to need to bring someone in for that. And again, it comes back to this idea where I'm not an absolutist. Again, it's much like your audience for anything. You think about what you're using something for or who's going to watch it, and then you plan accordingly. It, it there's I don't really necessarily think it's like one size fits all um, and yeah. for anything. <clears throat> No, and this kind of brings me back to the, the technology side. Like I know we'll say, you know, you have gimbals, you have, you know, the the phone holders, you know, the stabilizing holders, you've got your tripods, you've got shotgun mics and lapel mics. Like realistically, somebody doesn't need all of that stuff. Like granted, you can get a lot of that stuff at a decent price. Like I think I picked up a tripod last week for like 15 quid. That's just literally to hold my phone. Yeah. And I might buy a shotgun mic because you know, I have a big mic here for doing this stuff, but just for, you know, if I'm out and around and I need to do something, a shotgun mic might be handy, but it doesn't mean I need it. No, you don't need it. I mean, you make it work. Like I, I would always tell if people always come to me, especially, particularly uh, when I'm working, when I was working with corporate people, so with that, they'd be like, oh, I want to get a, uh, I, I want to start making videos for my business. I'm going to get a gimbal. And I was like, well, like why? And they're like, oh, because I have to have a gimbal to make videos. I was like, no, you don't. And you're not going to use it. You're going to use it twice. You're going to get frustrated because they have a tendency to, you have to weigh, like put in your phone and make sure it's weighs and all that sort of stuff. And then it might randomly go Whoo, and turn to the left or right. And you're like, well, this is annoying. I'm not going to use it. But a lot of people are like, I'm going to, I spent 250 quid on a gimbal, so I'm going to use it. I have two gimbals, three, rarely use them. Uh, rarely, I, I, but depending on what you're doing, I use my gimbal with my camera when I'm filming something. If I'm out filming a basketball match or a badminton or something like that, and I know I'm going to be moving around for a couple of, for an hour or two, yes, 100% I use it. But if I'm doing content on my phone or social media stuff or, or anything like that, generally I use uh, my hands uh, or yeah. I use a tripod um, yeah. or I place my phone against something. Um, but again, it comes down to the style and the type of stuff you're doing. What I would say if anyone's out there came to me and they're like, I want to get equipment, I'd say buy a decent microphone. Yeah. Uh, I would say that's where I'd invest all my money because yeah. sound matters. The example I always give in a class is that like if you shot something on a camera and you left the lens cap on for the first five minutes and people are like, well, how come the movie was so dark for the first five minutes? You could probably, if you're good enough at bullshit and you could probably say, oh, well, you know, the darkness at the start is a reflection of the main character's depression and it's a, yeah. to give the audience an insight into the darkness of their mind. And you could probably get away with that. Yes. Uh, but if you have crap sound, you, you 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 can't really get around that. If an audience is straining forward to listen, to try and hear dialogue, then it, all the lies in the world, and no matter how much of it, uh, you can't really hide the fact that that's just not great sound. So yeah. I always say to people, before you get a gimbal or anything like that, what kind of videos you're doing and, 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 and get a decent microphone because you yeah. can always walk with a phone and smooth the footage out if you want, um, yeah. and it's not a deal breaker. Uh, and and you build to these things, as you said. You, if you find you need a shotgun mic, you'll get it. But start with the basics, and then you'll find you'll reach the limits of what you can do with those basics, and then you'll start adding to your collection. Yeah. Like a shotgun mic, you'll get like a uh, you'll get like an entry level one thirty forty quid off Amazon. You know, if yeah. that's, you don't you know that. But if you want like lapel mics, they can go from anything from fifty to three hundred quid. But again, if you said to me, if you said to me I'm gonna get a shotgun mic for because I'm wanna record interviews with people on the street, I'd be like, I don't know, if you told me I want to get a lavalier mic, I'd be say, what are you doing? You're like, well I'm gonna record interviews with multiple people on the street. And then I'd say, well don't get that microphone, get a lavalier microphone. Sorry, get a, a shotgun microphone because it'll better suit your needs. Uh or you know if you just want to sit at home and talk to your own camera for social media, I'd say get a wireless lab or something like that. Um, and yeah. that you can hold in your hand or clip to your top and you don't have to think about it. 
Uh, but again, it's 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 building for what you need rather than just going out and spending hundreds or thousands on a bunch of equipment you're not going to use. Yeah, like I think one of the best, like as you said, sound is important. Like one of the best um, stories I've heard about on sound is the intro to Up was an accident. What's the uh, intro to Up again? The sad thing. The real, you know, the really sad montage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, there was actually talk. The, initially, the they were the characters were supposed to be speaking to each other, but somebody. Uh, like lost the audio file or something like that. Oh. So they put this music over it. And then when they found the audio files, they're like, actually, no, keep, keep well, it this way. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, you know, as you said, it's that idea of they had the cap over. It was like the sound quality was obviously rubbish or, you know. Or it just worked better and they didn't think of it that way until they finally seen it. Nobody thought, well, could we do it in silence? And then it was just the right piece of music and then it yeah. all kind of clicked together. And that's one of those happy kind of post-production things where you're like, oh, wow, I didn't envision it this way. And and that's what I would say to anyone, regardless of what you're shooting on. Like if you film stuff and you, you look at it and you go, this is awful. And it's only when you cut it together and you start adding music to it and all that sort of stuff and you start to see a flow, that's when it starts to become what you thought you were trying to make and what it inevitably ends up making is not what you initially thought it would be in your mind you get a different mm -hmm. beast altogether and then you have to work with that and um, but i know a lot of filmmakers would become disheartened after they film something and they're like oh, i give up or i don't want to do anymore and that is one of the dangers i think of of, of the mobile phone solution <coughs> is that film is a collaborative process uh, mm -hmm. and 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 your phone allows you to write shoot edit market score distribute all in a single device but i don't necessarily think one person should do all those things mm -hmm. i think you it's a great tool to teach you to edit but i don't necessarily think that you should always edit your own stuff i think there's a value to having a fresh pair of eyes come in yeah. and you know pull out the stuff that doesn't work from a story perspective rather than you knowing how much effort you put into that shot so it has to stay in i was like well it doesn't work and it's a waste of time so it needs to come out and so you do have a, this idea where there's a lot of people and they're like one man bands uh, and they're like i'm gonna write everything and i'm gonna act in it i'm gonna shoot everything and i'm gonna edit everything and i don't necessarily think that always makes for the best story or the best film sure. and because yeah. i think a collaboration is is in, and and that sort of conflict and that sort of idea that people throwing different things into the mix is more productive and what's evident of that is on a, on a larger scale is um a lot of filmmakers who work with netflix uh make really bad movies um because they're given free reign to do whatever they want and there's no one there to be like well maybe zach schneider your movie is a ripoff of four other different movies and you should maybe do something more unique. He just went and spent all that money on poor man Star Wars. Um, but you know what I mean? So that kind of thing, or if David Fincher made Mank, which was one of his more inferior films, although um, The Killer is, is, is one of his better films. So again, there's this idea that 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 limitation breeds creativity. And, and I don't necessarily think collaborating is a limitation, but having other voices in the room and different people looking at your stuff and maybe you know, a cinematographer and an editor and all that stuff is of real value to you, regardless of whether you're filming on a phone or a camera. I think that goes through, through all walks of life, though. Like, even like with, with Ghost, I'm the, I'm the mental case that it's like, oh, I want to do this. And Martin will go, John, no. Or, yeah, think about it. And I'm like, okay. Whereas if I was left to my own devices, I'd be doing 101 different things and none of it would make sense to anybody but me until it's all finished or ever finished and then you have you need you know you need that collaboration people someone yeah. you know who can kind of go let's you know and put restrictions on you yeah i think that that is it like you figure you figure out more when you get restricted but it, it i will say like editing you uh, using your phone as an editing tool is a great way to become a better filmmaker because you're mm -hmm. able to figure out what Hey, next time I film it, I'll get this shot and this shot because it won't work together without those. So being able to assemble the jigsaw yourself helps. But I just I don't necessarily always think uh, you, it, 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 you know, for larger projects or something like that. I think there's a value to, to like offloading your stuff to somebody and then kind of staying away from that process and just weighing in at the end and, and making decisions rather than kind of. I know. I mean, the first film I ever made was 23 minutes long and everybody I, I showed it to were like, yeah, it's fine. And I was like, does it need to be shorter? And they're like, absolutely not. It's perfect and whatever. And then years later, I found it and I edited it into two minutes um, sure. because there was a bunch of garbage in it that I knew, like I had gone off and filmed ships uh, that had run aground when the tide was out and I'd walked all the way out and filmed all the stuff. So these shots ended up in the movie and, and, and because I knew how long it took me to get them and the, the, the day I, I, they couldn't come out. You know what I mean? They were important and they just weren't, it was all excessive indulgent stuff that, uh, 
could have been taken out uh, from day one. Do you know what I mean? For a better viewing experience. Yeah. And, you know, you only live, you only learn that by doing, I suppose. Yeah, but but I'd be it. very ruthless now when it comes to a film. If somebody was to be like, if somebody, people and awful send me scripts to kind of give my, in, uh, my opinion on, and I'm like, take this out, remove this, drop the first four pages. I'd be very like, kind of things need to be short and things need to be uh, efficient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's that's where me and you would differ. I'd be like, that's lovely. <laughs> no, I used to be, but do you know what I mean? The, 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 the worst advice anyone or the worst feedback anyone can ever give you is that's fine because you don't learn anything from it. No, it you know what I mean? I, I'd much rather someone say that's garbage uh, yeah. in a nice way and then offer a, a, a constructive solution because then changes happen. Do you know what I mean? If you if everyone tells you that everything's fine, that's the one thing I'd say to filmmakers is like seek valid advice from people. Find somebody whose opinion you trust, because if you go and you ask your parents what they think of your movie, they're going to be like, that's lovely, dear. And you're like, that doesn't help me at all. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. give me any understanding of what to do next or where to go with that. Um, it's why I love my mom. She's probably the most no person yeah. you'll ever meet. It's like, I'm going to do this. Like, why? No, you're not. It's no. like, why are you doing that? Are you sure you can do that? It's like, wow. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's my mother as well. I, I yeah. like, I remember I set up the festival, and the first thing she says, Are you sure you're qualified to do that? And I was like, Well, I have a you know, I'm a background in festival management, so yeah, I'm pretty confident. Like, yeah, the one yeah, thing yeah. I have the ability to do, uh, maybe not well, but I can do it. Um, but yeah, yeah. It, it, it's that thing, yeah, it is, it is, it is, and like getting that good feedback. And sometimes it, it, you need that to kind of almost get your back up and go, No, I'm sure this part is right. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have that kind of middle ground of you, you need that pushback sometimes to go, I'm absolutely certain on this bit, but this bit, yeah, I get it. And then you're able to kind of mix and match. You know, trying to get back on track because I'm going to say great there for a few minutes. Uh, again, about it, it kind of comes back to your restrictions and you know the creativity. Like you have one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is it seven or eight categories in the film festival this year? We have international short film, Irish short film, music video, best documentary short, young filmmakers, which is like an under 16s category. Irish language short, so we've got two Irish categories and animated short. Yeah, right? so yeah, and we removed. We used to have a for a while, for a long time. We had a a three D um, category, which is something that we used to do. Not that it's particularly related to mobile phones, but it was just a. It was just you know we we like the idea of that kind of immersive type of filmmaking and stuff like that. But we don't yeah we don't do it anymore. But the and obviously we don't we're not doing the feature one this year. Yeah, so um the remaining categories we've expanded. We include an Irish language short. Um, because we're kind of interested in, I, I, basically, I'm I'm interested in the Irish language, and I would love to see more people making it. Uh, yeah, Oscar. So, the Irish short film is just like Irish creators only, and the Irish language short. So they're two different. Yeah, I mean, you could submit to both, but if you have filmed it, Oscar, you could submit to that category, and 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 um, and yeah, you've you know, it's a different. The films are selected differently. You know what I mean? If you had, if you'd three Irish language films, chances are we'll show three Irish language films, but if they're all lumped in with all the other Irish shorts, if you know what I mean, it's it, it's yeah. a larger category to pull films from. So, I'd assume, now this is where I'm going to be probably corrected because I'm wrong more often than I'm right, but in terms of animated short shot on a mobile phone, I'd assume that's more claymation, stock motion, that kind of stuff. Not necessarily, no. I mean, there was a filmmaker who used to submit to us every year and he made these incredible, he was from Poland, I think, he made these incredible uh, um, animated, they look like uh, sketch drawings that come to life. Oh, and okay. us, myself and the judges were always like, how is he doing these things? And then he filmed a, uh, a, a thank you acceptance speech and he showed us how to do it. And he was basically drawing on his iPad with a pen and he was sketching them the same way he would in a sketch pad, but he was able to animate them that way. Um, and so, yeah, no, it's animated of all kinds. It could be stop motion, could be, um, uh, as I said, animated like that. Mm. People using various animation apps um, to create stuff. So, yeah, um, it, it, it can be pretty broad. Yeah, is it obvious that I'm an animation fan? No, Disney you zeroed didn't... straight in on that. Yeah, yeah Disney <laughs> didn't get me at an early age and just keep um, it locked in. Um, uh, I, like, I really look like I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out this year because I've, you know, I've looked on the website. I've seen like the 2023 winners. And there's some really cool projects there. Like you had, is this everybody's Oma? So like that's about someone's grandmother. 
and you had some really yeah cool there was a filmmaker it was a filmmaker uh in australia who had uh, his mother had dementia and so he uh i i'd met the i did spoken to the mother they'd recorded speeches in the past for the festival and stuff like that so his mother passed away but uh she became before she passed away she'd become a, a social media sensation uh, okay. during lockdown and stuff like that um and so he took all the footage he had and uh, and turned it into a movie about kind of what it's uh, elder care and the burdens and the joys of looking after a loved one as they get older i would highly recommend anybody who's because i can guarantee you have people there'll be some people listening to this going like yeah smartphone recording yeah it's probably great but like it's not going to have the same production quality and i'm sure there's always going to be some people like that i highly recommend checking out the website because if you just go under winning films you have there is some great examples there's like sizzle there's like the best music video from last year you have like so there's a lovely blend between documentary music video kind of this like horror style and like the, you wouldn't tell half of these are recorded on a phone that's no, and, and, uh, I remember we I shot a, we shot a f film in the IFI a couple of years ago, and it was by a, an Oscar-winning director, and he made it not he didn't win the Oscar this short. It was a follow-up short he did, uh, and I put it on in a test thing. I was just testing the film on the on the projector, and one of the staff came up to me and they're like, "Are you telling me that was filmed on a phone?" Yeah. And I was like, "Yeah," and and she was just blown away by. It. I wish I'd have got that as a social media video, but yeah. um, uh, but yeah. So I mean, it's it's it's. I tell you, it's 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 sort of irrelevant, and you do get the odd person online who's like oh don't be stupid it's just filming on your phone how difficult is that and all that sort of stuff um but they're all lunatics and you know if you're gonna go out of your way to write a comment like that on facebook you've already lost effectively yeah, uh, because you're giving up your free time um uh the only finite resource you can't get back uh so um the the, the i suppose the point is, is that there, there'll always be pushback but i mean it, it, it's not really about that it's just about creating and and and, and uh, like people used to always say to me are you not worried that now that everyone can make movies uh you know, films are going to get worse. And I was like, well, no, a pen and paper's been around for years. It doesn't mean everyone writes a book. Um, and it's just, this, it does, you could do it if you want to. And it's a tool there that will give you the opportunity to be able to do it. Maybe you won't like it. Maybe you won't keep it up. But, you know, it'll, the, the fact that cameras are so expensive would have left the door closed for a lot of people. And that door is not, no longer needs to be closed. Yeah. That's a lovely way to put it. It's a really good way to put it. How do, like, this is my last question. Uh, yeah. Unless there's anything that you want to cover yourself like a lot of there's there's an awful lot of push towards you know, uh, ai these days mm -hmm. like do how do we see that impacting this industry uh i'm using it i'm using ai in an upcoming project um again i i, I somebody i i had this conversation the other day uh i, I was talking about showing kids how to uh, use ai to edit animated sequences and videos i was like shoot videos in your phone and then animate them using ai and somebody was like oh well are you are you not worried that you're teaching people you're taking jobs away from animators and i was like well, well no not really i mean the, the, again the tools are there and those tools aren't going away and I, I don't have the discipline or patience to use after effects and if i was doing a large project i probably would hire somebody to do that to fill in that yeah. project but you know, as a tool to help expand my creativity and understand uh, what I can do, yeah, I, I'd use AI. I'd use AI apps to animate footage, um, and I'm going to use one for an upcoming project, um, simply because I want to play around as a tool. So it, Pandora's box has been open, and and it's not going away. And so we have to kind of embrace these tools that exist and where they fit into the society and the in the industries it goes. I don't know. I'm not for not for one, i'm not one of these people who say well we should just use ai for everything and and, and no. not use uh, computer effects people i mean there's literally thousands of people pushing vhf v vfx apps and vfx tools on instagram and stuff like that and they're all garbage and, yeah. and they're like look at the vfx in my video and it's like your video looks doesn't look good like this is not good because they're not again they're not experts at it they're not they're, it, it, it's like dropping a filter onto your video. It's like, look, yeah. I've put fire in the corner of my garden. It doesn't look real. And my eye can tell it's not real. And so there's experts out there. And depending on the project, they're the people that I would go to. But for smaller stuff, for the stuff I'm using, if it, it gives me a chance to be able to include it in a project where before I wouldn't even think of doing it. Um, and so that's the value for me as a chance to experiment and broaden my creativity. No, that, that makes sense. I don't think there's anything left for me to cover. I think I've asked everything that I had to ask. Is there anything that you want to say, cover yourself before we wrap up for today? 
No, not at all. I mean, the festival starting on March 30th. Tickets, I'd say, will go on sale maybe March 1st. They sell out pretty quick because spaces are limited. Uh, we'll be having a workshop in the IFI, uh, which we do every year, which is great. Again, spaces are all limited for that. Um, so it's kind of a first come, first serve basis. Uh, we'll be announcing the winners, I'd say, or the selected films, not the winners. We'll be announcing them in the next two weeks or, or so, I'd say. Um, and so um, it'll be all go, go, go. But um, as I said, if people are interested in coming along, it is just a fun, easygoing event. And what's great about it is we try to organize a networking element to it. So we try to get people creating films from yeah. um, the festival. Um, every year in the past, we've done like a global film project where we've kind of produced films around the world and given people equipment uh, in order to be able to create films for the festival. This year, we decided to keep it more homegrown. So we've... Um, We've uh, given foot. We've given uh, equipment to uh, Irish filmmakers, um, and they've made a a, a detective spoof uh, in like okay. Naked Gun um, uh, kind of spoof short. And so that'll be premiering at the festival, and it's great because it's, we're just helping people create, giving them access to lenses and tripods and rigs and stuff like that that they can they can shoot that. So that's uh, an Irish project that's going to premiere at the event. Brilliant. So where can people buy tickets and where can people like find out more about the event they can find out more on our website www.dublinsmartphonefilmfestival.com and they can buy tickets when they become available in the same place perfect or or through our social media at uh, dublinsmartphonefilmfestival.com instagram's probably the best place to catch us brilliant yep no i think like this was brilliant it was great to catch up and i always like talking you know about anything tech related but especially like anything that like this that makes something that seemed so difficult and closed off years ago to make it so just simple and accessible that anybody of any background can pick up a phone and go, I'm going to make a movie today. So Rob, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. No worries. Cool. So Thanks look, so much. This is out on YouTube now. It'll be available on Spotify and everywhere else where you can get your podcasts. Uh, you can find us obviously across every social media account. And I keep saying this, we are also on threads now. So it's goose underscore IE across every platform. And if you're on TikTok, look up Marty from Goose and check out the video content that he's doing. Other than that, it's been a pleasure and we'll see you all soon. Good luck. <laughs>